Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Mara Walsh and I'm your host today for our tour to Greece. I have always um, been a lover of Greece and I'm so happy to be able to share it with you today. I've opened up this event uh, as well on our Facebook page so that we will have some viewers from outside of Zoom as well. Uh, let me share a little bit about myself um, for those that don't know me. I'm a travel group leader um, and use EF Tours and their adult division Go Ahead Tours as my travel partner. That is not my full-time job, but that is my passion and it's a way for me to um, enjoy traveling with friends. So I lead group tours. I started leading tours as a Girl Scout leader, taking girls and their families to international destinations every summer. I have since expanded my travel program and added adult only tours as well as family friendly tours. I've traveled all over the world with groups as large as 70 and as small as 17, depending on the tour and the interest in that destination. I see a lot of people on this virtual tour today that I know and some that are new to me and some that I've even been to Greece with in the past. In the absence of physical travel, I thought it would be fun to travel virtually and it has really taken off. We've done several tours in the past weeks, including Rome, Edinburgh, Paris, London, Peru, and Ireland. And um, I know many of you have joined us for some of that. If you have missed out on any of those tours and you wanna access the recording, they are available on my website, which is girltraveltours.com. Just go to the tab with the virtual tours and you can access any of them. We have several more tours in the works uh, for the weeks to come. We have Ecuador, Prague, Egypt, Spain, and I'm working on a literary tour of the UK, Russia, China, and some others. You can register for future tours at the same website, girltraveltours.com. But today we are off to Greece, one of my most favorite destinations. But before we get going, I wanna share with you a few ways that you can interact with us during this event. Feel free to ask questions about Greece, the tour director, or my travel program by using the Q&A link on your Zoom toolbar. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the tour where the tour director will address all of your questions. You can also chat me up at the chat, which is also on the um, toolbar, if you have a communication that you want me to directly answer to. But if you have a question that you want the tour director to respond to, please use the Q&A. I also like to include an interactive poll. Um, we're gonna do that right now. This poll is going to give us a gauge of what your connection to Greece is. So the question is, what's your connection? I've been in love it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future, or I'm solely interested in experiencing it virtually. I'm gonna wait a minute while the polls are being answered by the um, attendees. We have, um, oh, probably three or 400 people on right now, and I'm gonna wait till about 75% of them answer it. It looks like most of the people, more than 50%, plan to visit in the future. I'm gonna share the results so that you can see them. And then we have a pretty decent amount of people, over 30%, that have been and loved it. And I, I am so happy to see that there's always a nice percentage of people that are just here to virtually enjoy these tours. So I really appreciate you being here as well. Okay, so we're gonna move on from here. Regardless of how much you know about Greece, we hope that you enhance that on this virtual tour today. And I can assure you that Elena will share some unique perspectives that you are not aware of. A tour will not be complete without a fantastic tour director. A tour director is like a personal travel concierge who stays with your group from start to finish and shares a world of knowledge, manages all of your tour plans, and makes sure your experience is stressless and full of positive experiences, allowing you to fully enjoy your travels. These folks are by far the most important people in our group. And you can imagine if we're not traveling, because of the pandemic, these tour directors are not working. 
So I'm hoping that this virtual tour will not only reignite our desire to travel, but allows the tour director to do what she does best, which is share her knowledge and passion for a destination while earning some tips as well. And one of my absolute favorite tour directors just happens to be an expert on Greece and was excited to come back for another virtual tour this summer. I'm honored to introduce you to, and I'm gonna hand over this event to my dear friend and our amazing tour director, Elena Salerno. Thank you, Mara. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's event. Um, I just wanted to point out that when Mara says uh, that a tour director is like a travel concierge in, in my industry, we have a joke uh, amongst us tour directors and we say we're actually ninjas. So <laughs> we really try to accomplish the impossible and sometimes we succeed. Uh, before I start sharing my screen, I was, um, uh, my eye was uh, captured by the Q&A. We already have two questions uh, and uh, from Christy. Hi, Christy. And I just wanted to uh, read the first one because it made me smile. She's asking, how is Greece like? And I just wanted to let her publicly know that I hope uh, I will fully answer the question for her with the presentation tonight. So I'm sharing my screen. Let me see. There you go. You should be able to see what I'm seeing. And let's start. So um, let's start with uh, something totally unintelligible. <laughs> this is, of course, two Greek words. And they read the Kalos Irtate, which means welcome. So welcome to tonight's event. We're going to talk, of course, about Greece or Ellada, as it's uh, its actual name in Greece, because the official name of the nation is the Hellenic Republic. So I thought uh, for the ones of you who followed already the couple events that I that I did with Mara, you know, I like to give titles to my presentations and I decided to entitle this one an Eladic Wanderlust. So let's get going. A brief outline. Um, I put it together so that I'm in the hope that it will make it uh, easier for you to follow the whole presentation throughout. We're going to start with a general intro and then move on to our actual virtual stops. Um, I divided tonight's virtual tour in two parts. Uh, in the first part, we're going to see a couple places on mainland Greece. And these are going to be Athens, of course, and Delphi. And then we move on to the second part of the presentation that I called the island hopping. And this is going to be a big eye candy, I assure you, for everyone. And uh, I have been immersed in images uh, of Greek islands in the past two weeks uh, while putting together these slides uh, and I'm dying. I'm dying to go <laughs> to get back, really. So island hopping is going to be two islands in the Ionian Sea. We're going to see together Zakynthos and Kefalonia. And uh, in the Aegean Sea, Santorini and Ikaria. And there's always a little bonus at the end. Uh, to cap it all off. I always start with uh, giving you an idea of where the place that we focus on is placed uh, within the world. So of course, um, uh, tonight's event uh, is about a whole country. And it made me laugh. At some point, I realized that the first time Mara asked me to collaborate with her on these virtual tours, we decided to put together a walking tour through a part of the center of Rome. And then the second time she asked, uh, um, she wanted a presentation on the city of Paris. And this is the third time and she asked a whole nation. So uh, we have a lot to cover and uh, I hope I will, not, uh, I will not be too long, but I'm just warning you that the next time it might be a whole continent. So uh, the reference point for latitude, of course, is Athens, the capital, which is placed on the 40th parallel north on the red line that I draw on the map right there where you see the arrow. From Athens moving eastward, ideally, you would encounter Beijing, which is placed on the same parallel. Whereas uh, moving westward, you would find Philly on the uh, eastern coast of the US. Uh, the border between Nebraska and Kansas uh, is marked by this parallel in the Midwest, more or less. And then on the west coast, the parallel runs just north of the city of San Francisco. Within Europe, 
Greece uh, is, uh, you see it in this image marked in the darker green, and it gives us a really good idea of how it occupies the southeasternmost corner of Europe. Its borders are with Turkey to the east, with Bulgaria, North Macedonia, and Albania to the north, and then it is mainly surrounded by the sea, the sea which is the Mediterranean Sea, but it takes on different names depending on the area, the different area. So the part of the Mediterranean Sea lying to the west of mainland Greece is called Ionian Sea, and the part lying to the west is called Aegean Sea, which is the typical Greek Sea. When you want to talk about Greece, Aegean is the typical attribute. Uh, regarding our general intro, it's very difficult to concentrate the history uh, of Greece uh, in uh, just a few moments, just a few minutes. It has a really, really long history. It was the place where the first advanced civilizations uh, happened in the history of humanity. So because of this, uh, nowadays everyone agrees that Greece uh, is really the birthplace of Western civilization at least. They have left us, the ancient Greeks, uh, with a heritage uh, that is immense uh, and we are immersed in it every day, in everything that we do, in every word that we use, um, in every aspect of our everyday life, even when we don't realize it, we are doing something, we're looking at something, we're thinking at something that comes from the Greek culture, ancient culture. And just to give you a very few examples, uh, they left us their beautiful architectures uh, that uh, spawned uh, so many styles in the centuries uh, afterwards. Uh, they left us literature, Homer that we see in this bust, uh, wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are considered the origin of uh, uh, Western uh, literature. They left us poetry. They left us the theater that still to this day in all its different, of course, declinations and variations we enjoy. They left us the sports and especially competitive sports uh, being the inventors of the Olympic Games. Uh, by the way, the Olympic Games uh, that were held uh, almost 800 years before Christ to the first time, uh, that was the date uh, that the ancients used uh, to mark the date. So of course, before Christ, uh, there was no year zero. And the reference point in time for them was the year of, of the first uh, Olympic Games. So it had a big importance for them too, as it has for us today. Philosophy, another big aspect of Greek culture, in this beautiful Raphael painting, we see Plato and Aristotle, who are probably the two most famous philosophers of ancient Greek, but so many other thinkers of those times uh, that, again, um, formed uh, or at least uh, helped forming the thoughts of so many generations uh, that came after them. Science, uh, math, uh, astronomy, uh, maritime sciences, uh, and so on. And probably, possibly, the biggest gift of all was the invention of democracy that we are still enjoying and using to this day. Even though I thought that probably if the ancient Greeks could see what we made of uh, their idea of democracy, they probably wouldn't be too happy about it. Now, uh, as for our stops, we are going to start with Athens, the capital, then move on a very short way away to the site of Delphi, still on the mainland. And then for our island hopping, we start in the Ionian Sea to the west with the island of Zakynthos and then Kefalonia, and then move to the Aegean Sea with Santorini and Ikaria finally. So let's start with our Athens. Uh, I liked this image that I wanted to show you uh, because um, it does give uh, a little bit of an idea of what Athens looks like uh, when you try to take it all in at once. Of course, the image is partial. Athens uh, is a very spread out city. Even though it is not such a huge metropolitan area, the citizens of Athens uh, are more or less between seven and 800,000, so they don't reach the million. But it is a very spread out metropolis, uh, and the image gives you a good idea of the fact that it is nestled uh, uh, between these mountains, these uh, hilly landscape, let's say. Uh, in fact, contrary to what we often believe, uh, Athens doesn't overlook the water. It is not on the seashore. We see it well in this map. Athens uh, is a little bit inland, but of course it does have a harbor that serves it, that it's also the main harbor in the whole nation, which is called Piraeus, 
It lies the southwest of Athens on the coast. And the thing is that Piraeus is a city in itself, a separate city from Athens. But in time, the suburbs of both places grew towards one another so much that now if you start walking from Athens towards uh, Piraeus, uh, you will find uh, only suburbs. So there's no countryside left. So the two cities merged, uh, even though administratively speaking, they are still left separate. This beautiful photo gives an idea of uh, what I mean when I say that they are all connected, uh, the suburbs and the two cities. So we start from the shore with Piraeus and we can glimpse, uh, we can have an idea of the harbor and then going towards the inland, towards the mountains, uh, we are also looking at Athens in this photo. This is a map of Athens uh, and uh, I know it's not clear, I just included it to give you an idea of the intricacy of this uh, city, even though it's not uh, uh, a super huge metropolitan area. And also to show you that we are going to concentrate our attention in this uh, sector of the map, which is uh, a little simpler uh, in this uh, touristic map. Uh, to show you what we're going to see together, we're going to start from here with the Acropolis and then I'm going to show you two other uh, neighborhoods in town, Monastiraki and Plaka. Of course, other than the Acropolis, uh, Athens has uh, archaeological ruins from its ancient glorious past scattered all throughout the city. We haven't the time to see them all, but just so that you can have a an idea of them, we have the two actually Agora, one Greek, one Roman, the main market square at the time. The gorgeous uh, remains of the library of Emperor Hadrian built during Roman times, the Roman occupation, and as well as Hadrian's arch, and uh, what remains of the huge temple of Zeus. And these are only some examples of the archaeological beauties that you can admire once you visit Athens. Uh, we get to my first suggestion tonight. I always try to keep in mind uh, that uh, a lot of you will, I hope for you, at some point visit uh, the places that we talk about. So I try to fill my presentations with advices. And my first suggestion would be that all these archaeological sites uh, are within walking distance uh, one another. And they are all linked, they have all been linked by the city with this beautiful pedestrian uh, uh, path that is called the Dionysio Aropagiu. I wrote it down just if someone wants to write it down. Huh? So you can see how it's, uh, because the spelling is a little bit difficult in Greek, uh, in Greek names. Huh? So it runs very smoothly through the, the, the city uh, center at the bottom of the Acropolis too. So this is the path that you would take to get to the ruins of the Acropolis. But it also wanders off uh, and it branches out uh, uh, climbing the different hills uh, that lie at the foot of the taller one uh, that is the Acropolis. So it is a beautiful walk uh, through Mediterranean vegetations. You can see oleander trees, olive trees, bougainvilleas. Uh, it is gorgeous in the spring when they are all in bloom, of course. Uh, and then it rises up all the way to the top of one of these hills uh, from which you can enjoy this amazing view of the Acropolis of Athens. So what is the Acropolis? Uh, Acropolis is a generic word. It's not the specific name of this uh, one. Acropolis means uh, mm, higher city. So it is a, a, a spot uh, on top of uh, an altitude, a rock as in this case, or a hill that overlooks the rest of the city upon which the ancient Greeks uh, built uh, the main spot in town. Uh, then the, the buildings on, on, this, uh, on this square, let's call it, uh, could have different functions. It wasn't just the main religious uh, spot in town. It could also have a commercial importance, uh, a financial importance, a social importance for people to meet together. But it had this sacred uh, uh, halo uh, because of, again, being uh, on a higher level than the rest of the city. So no one could live uh, on the rock, on the higher point of the city that the Acropolis was. All ancient Greek cities had their own Acropolis. When we say Acropolis, nowadays we don't specify that we mean the Athens one because it is uh, the most famous one. And nowadays the term has come to mean the Athens one. It is also probably the best preserve uh, that we have nowadays. Uh, climbing the Acropolis, uh, you would enter from uh, the monumental entrance uh, that the Greeks uh, built uh, uh, 
uh, intending it uh, as a monumental entrance for the crowds uh, getting onto the top of the rock. It's called Propyleia. You see beautifully built in white marble as all the monuments uh, on the Acropolis. And a little curiosity about the Propyleia of the Athens Acropolis is that they were the model they inspired the design for Berlin's Brandenburg Gate, uh, which is uh, a famous landmark uh, in the German city nowadays. We have to talk about Athena for a second. Athena, the goddess Athena, is the patron goddess of the city of Athens. Athens is named after her. And she has to do a lot with uh, the Acropolis and its monuments uh, because it was all built uh, in her honor and for her worship. Uh, the legend goes, uh, that uh, both Athena and her uncle Poseidon, the god of all waters, wanted uh, to be the rulers, uh, the main uh, divinity of the city of Athens. So they had a competition going and uh, Zeus at some point, uh, the father of all the gods, uh, decided that he would be the judge uh, of the competition and the competition would entail both gods uh, to give a gift uh, to the citizens of Athens, and Zeus would be the judge of which of the two gifts uh, was uh, uh, the most precious one and the, the most useful one for the people. And that would be the winner, that would decide the winner of the competition. So Poseidon started on top of the Acropolis. He hit the ground in his trident and uh, uh, a horse came out of the hole that he had made in the ground. Now this was not any horse, this was the first horse in the history of the world. So he had invented the horse in that moment and he had gifted this animal to Athenians. It had a lot of utility. It's a very powerful, strong animal that you can use uh, in battle, in war, and helps you win uh, battles, but it, it can also help you with your labor. So it was a very useful gift. But then Athena hit the ground with her spear and in the spot where she hit the ground, an olive tree branched out. Uh, and this was the olive tree, the first one ever uh, to be on earth. So she invented the olive tree. And Zeus decided that this uh, would win the competition because the olive tree has many uses that the Greeks uh, have uh, employed throughout the centuries and still do to this, to this day. You can use the leaves uh, to make medicaments and ointments. You can use the wood from the trees to build ships or buildings. Uh, the olives are something that you can eat, or if you press them, you get uh, fantastic olive oil that to this day the Greeks put in every one of their dishes. So the olive tree got to become one of the symbols uh, that was always associated with the goddess Athena. The other one of her symbols, because she was the goddess of wisdom, was the owl. Because given the owl can see at night, uh, it was symbolical for someone uh, that was very wise. Uh, we have testimony of all of this uh, on the coinage, on the coins uh, that ancient Athenians uh, uh, had as a currency, the drachmas. You can see that both uh, her symbols uh, are represented on the coins, the owl and the branch from the olive tree. The olive tree for us is very much recognizable as a symbol because then Christianity gave it an ulterior spin with the story of Noah sending a dove after the flooding and the dove coming back with an olive tree in her branch. And because of this, it became also a symbol of peace. So we see it here in a beautiful drawing by Picasso uh, and we recognize it always as a symbol of peace, uh, even nowadays. Now, the main temples that remain standing on top of the Acropolis that we're going to see together are the Parthenon, probably the most famous temple in the whole world nowadays, and the Erecteion. The Parthenon is a gorgeous, uh, fantastic uh, uh, archaeological remain of a huge grand temple. It was the main temple for the Greeks in Athens, uh, dedicated to the goddess Athena for her worship. And also this photo gives you an idea of the sheer size of this place. It was built monumentally with this uh, gorgeous white marble um, sourced locally in a quarry just outside, uh, kind of outside of Athens. Of course, we are left with only parts of the Parthenon. A lot of it uh, uh, we lost, but to give you an idea of what it might have looked like when it was built, uh, this is what it was. Uh, we see it in section so that we can also see the inner chamber 
that no one but the priest could access uh, where the huge seven feet tall statue of Athena was kept for worship. We can also notice that it was colorful. It wasn't white as sometimes we think. Uh, Greeks and Romans uh, made their temples, their buildings, their statues even very much colorful. The decorations especially were, were painted over with colors. Uh, the decorations, uh, uh, part of the decorations remain nowadays, so let's break them up. We have the pediment that are two actually, one for each of the two shorter sides. And the pediment is the triangular section on top of the entrance, decorated with uh, uh, round statues. Maybe you recognize the shape here. These are the statues that remain from one of the two pediments of the Parthenon. Unfortunately, and I'm putting my opinion in this, but unfortunately, this uh, setting is not in Greece. They are held in the British Museum. They have a specially designed room to house the decorations they took from the Parthenon. This happened in the 1800s when a, an English aristocrat, who he wasn't an archeologist, he just dabbled in archeology, span went to Greece, went to Athens, uh, saw these sculptures, they were lying on the ground. They had fallen already from uh, the pediment of the Parthenon. And uh, at the time, Greece was under Turkish rule. They weren't independent, so they didn't have a central government. Uh, it was easy for him to ask for permission. The permission was given by the Turks, who couldn't care less about uh, you know, the ownership of these uh, ancient ruins. And he brought them back with him to London, where they still are today. There is a big dispute regarding the marbles of the Parthenon, and Greece wants them back. And uh, uh, England had promised to give them back uh, uh, once uh, the Greeks uh, had built a proper house for them, a proper museum. And they had, it opened its doors uh, almost 10 years ago. The marbles are still in London. So the United Nations are entering this dispute to, to try and solve it, uh, but it's a very, a very difficult one. Going on with the decorations of the temple, in the inner chamber, the outside of the inner chamber had this gorgeous frieze that ran all along the length, uh, the perimeter of the temple. This is a detail of it. It was all sculpted in high relief uh, with the images of a procession. So it went all around. And uh, this too is uh, in the British Museum. The frieze originally was 524 feet long. We have 80% of it left, and most of this 80% uh, is now in the British Museum in London. Um, this is a story that I learned about uh, while I was putting together these slides. Uh, we are looking at what is called the Parthenon of Books. This is an artistic installation that was done for a festival in 2017. The festival was held uh, as it usually is in the city, in the German city of Kassel. And the, uh, the work is by an Argentinian uh, artist. So what she did is because in that year for that edition of the festival, uh, they were housing it both in Kassel, but also in Athens. This is a nod uh, from the artist uh, to the Greek city to you know, give it an ideal bridge between the two cities. And uh, it is called the Parthenon of Books because she built this metal structure that has the same measurement as the original Parthenon, so it is huge. But she covered the pillars uh, and the perimeter of the metal structure with books, with hundreds of thousands of books uh, that nowadays in some part of the world uh, are under censorship. This is a detail that shows you uh, in a close up the books. They were covered in plastic, of course, to protect them. And they were hung to the pillars of this artistic installation. She did this, uh, of course, as a monument to democracy and free thought, but also because Kassel in Germany is one of the cities uh, where in 1933 groups of Nazis uh, burned books, uh, books that weren't aligned uh, with uh, Nazi uh, ideology and propaganda. So they had a very strong censorship going and it happens still today in many countries in the world. So she decided the most iconic building from the most iconic of democracies in history would be the perfect structure to hang these books on. After the festival was done, the, uh, the structure was taken down and the books were uh, gifted to the population. So it was also 
um, an, a nice idea. One last image of the Parthenon to show you how beautifully it is lit at night. Uh, and then we move on to the Erecteion, the other monument that we look at on the Acropolis, another temple that had also these two smaller bodies on the sides that were tombs for important people. If you go around it, you see it's built on two different levels and on the lower one is this uh, luscious uh, olive tree that it's supposed to be the one that Athena uh, famously in the legend uh, gifted to the Athenians. But the Erecteion is particularly famous uh, because of the portico of the maidens, uh, this add on to the side, it's a very small porch. Uh, this image also shows us what beautiful colors the stone takes uh, in the different times, this is at sunset, so it becomes all pink. The portico of the maiden is a porch where the columns are shaped in the, uh, in the shape of women instead of being just simple columns. These are, this is a detail so that you can see them a bit better. These are all copies. The real, they are called karyatids. They have been taken out of the portico and uh, been placed uh, indoors to protect them from the elements. All but one, actually, one of the two angular ones, so one of the two corner ones, uh, is in the British Museum. It was uh, one of the decorations taken by Lord Elgin. In the fifth century before Christ, uh, so 400 and some years before Christ, uh, which is the time that we refer to when we talk about classical times, classical Greece, classical art, this is the height of the ancient Greek civilization. So all these things happened more or less in the fifth century before Christ and the Acropolis at the time looked like this. So the things that we have seen together that still stand are the Propyleia, the entrance to the uh, Esplanade, the Erecteion to the left and the Parthenon. You see the sheer size of the Parthenon even with all the buildings uh, uh, up in the Acropolis. Uh, it was really, really huge. One last monument before we leave this area of Athens, uh, we see it from above uh, in this image and it gives us a really good idea of the shape, uh, is the Odeon of Herods. Uh, this is not on top of the uh, Acropolis, on top of the rock. This is at the side and bottom of it. So you would see it uh, before climbing to the Acropolis top. And it was a place for shows. This uh, is the view that you would have uh, had you been standing on one of the, on the, of the stands for the audience. But uh, uh, the Odeon is not a theater. There was a difference for the ancient Greeks. A theater, and I'm sure you all know already, was a place where plays uh, happened. So dramas and comedies. And Odeon was uh, uh, dedicated to music shows, so concerts. And you might uh, want to know, this might be another suggestion for your next Athens trip, that the Odeon of Herods is still used as a venue for concerts nowadays. And it must be something, it's actually on my bucket list uh, to go at a concert in the Odeon of Herods because it must be really spectacular with this background uh, uh, to, to attend the concert here. Uh, there will be the usual links uh, to videos uh, that I can never show you videos on Zoom, which is a shame, but I always link uh, the ones that I think are pertinent to Mara so that she can send them out. And there are two or three of concerts held in the Odeon of Herods throughout time, modern time. There is one... Uh, is Andrea Bocelli singing the opera, which has to be really something moving and I think a sting concerts. I have to choose because there were so many. One last image of the Acropolis at night to show you all of it lit up and also to show you how close uh, it is to the sea. So you can see the water from the top of the Acropolis. The Acropolis Museum that I mentioned before, the one that the Greeks did open 10 years ago to house uh, the beautiful decorations uh, from ancient Greece and to protect them, uh, lies to the side of the Acropolis at the bottom of the hill. And it has a very peculiar modern shape. I did, uh, um, I did enlighten it in this, uh, in this uh, photo to show you that the last floor of the museum is basically a glass box. And it is uh, in the shape, uh, orientation, and has the same measurements as the Parthenon. So from within that last floor, 
you can actually see the Parthenon. You see it up here through the glass. You can see the top of the Acropolis. And this last floor is all dedicated to the different decorations that were taken down from the monument and mounted on the walls within this glass floor exactly in the same positioning as they would have on the original monument. So you can look outside the window to you know, have a link to the actual thing and get an idea of what it must have been like when they hung on the monument itself. So let's leave the Acropolis and move to the next area, which is called Monastiraki. Monastiraki uh, has also a Monastiraki square at the center of it, which is this uh, beautiful square from which you can see the Acropolis. We're very close to it. I like this square very much because it's very emblematic of, in general, Greece and not just Athens, uh, emblematic of uh, all the hundreds of influences uh, that their culture has uh, uh, and that their history was constellated with. In this square you have, uh, and the square takes the name from, this uh, building in the bottom left corner, which was a monast monastery. So monastiraki means small monastery in Greek, and it is a Christian, it was a Christian monastery from Byzantine times. But there is another religious monument on the square, which is this one at the very center of the picture, which was originally a mosque. Nowadays, it has been turned into the Ceramic Museums, Museum of Athens. It's a very tiny, lovely museum, but it was originally a mosque. So these are already two influences, not Greek in origin, but Christian one and uh, Muslim the second from the Turkish, who dominated over Greece for centuries that give us an idea of how many other peoples uh, lived in these lands uh, and left marks uh, on uh, the people's traditions and everyday life. The other spot in Monastiraki area that I'd like to suggest for your next Athens trip is the central market. So this is an active grocery market where people do their grocery shopping and um, I don't know about you, but when I travel on my own, I always go to either markets or supermarkets because I, I like to see what the locals eat, uh, what they buy, how they do their shopping. I think uh, it gives you a very precise idea of some of their habits, of their routines, and it tells you a lot about the culture of the place that you're visiting. So this is a very lively, picturesque market that you can visit. It's an indoor market uh, in this lovely building. Uh, they sell all sorts of fresh food, of course, fresh fish. They also have meat, but I didn't include a photo because you need a very strong stomach in that corner of the market. Uh, fresh fruits and veggies. They're super famous olives, uh, Greek olives, uh, but they also have dried fruits and all sorts of nuts and spices. If you get hungry in the market, all around Monastiraki, you will see these sellers uh, uh, this is a typical street food in Athens uh, so for a snack, for a salty snack, and it's a round uh, uh, bread. It has the shape more or less of a bagel, maybe a bit bigger, but it is encrusted with sesame seeds. Uh, it's really lovely. And the Greeks, they call it kuluri. Uh, another example, uh, another instance uh, that shows us a lot how much the Greeks were influenced also by others, or maybe they themselves influenced others, is that the same exact same bread is sold in Turkey, only they sell it like this in the streets of Istanbul, and they call it simit, but it's exactly the same thing. If you're into something sweeter, then as a street food, I suggest lukumades. Lukumades, again, are sold everywhere, not just in Athens, but in Greece. They are a very typical sweet uh, street food. And they are uh, little donut holes, deep fried donut holes. The classic way of enjoying them is plain with just uh, honey drizzled on top of them. But uh, if you don't like them or if you prefer something else, they come also with melted chocolate on them or with uh, uh, cinnamon and nuts, or with fresh fruit. So you really have a lot of varieties to choose from. And um, one of the links that you will receive is a video of the making of, in a street, from a street vendor, the making of, the deep frying, and the making of the lukumades. 
Uh, we move on to the next area of town. We are still very close to both the Acropolis and Monastiraki. This area is called Placa. And even though Placa nowadays has become a very touristic area, because given it's the dead center of town, it's impossible not to go through its streets if you are visiting as a tourist. Uh, but it is uh, still very authentic. And it is the oldest neighborhood in Athens. So not only it is dotted with cafes and restaurants with all their tables outside where you can just enjoy people watching, which is an Olympic sport in Greece, uh, the beautiful trees, the bougainvilleas in bloom, but it also have some, has some very peculiar, unique architectures nowadays in Athens, uh, coming from more modern times, the 1700s, the 1800s, uh, that are left only here in the city. In other parts of the city, they don't remain anymore. So it's also very interesting because of that. And I want to give you one example. This is the Venizelos or Venizelos Mansion. Uh, this is the, considered the oldest house in Athens, and it is in the Placa district. The Benizelos mansion has now been turned into a museum, so it's a very tiny museum, so one can visit it. It has this lovely inner courtyard uh, with uh, an ancient olive press and an ancient well, and it has the arches uh, uh, in stone at the bottom floor and then the wood and the timber on the top floor, which was the typical way of building houses for wealthy people, of course. Uh, in the 1500s and 1600s. So this building comes from those times. It was built at the middle of the 1500s and it was the house of a rich family in Athens. Um, there, is, there is a story behind this building that I like very much that I wanna tell you about. This couple had a daughter and uh, the daughter uh, was married off when she was very, very young. She was 14 years old and she was married off to an abusive husband, unfortunately. But um, luckily for her at this point, uh, in the turn of just three years, uh, she found herself an orphan and also a widow. She lost uh, her parents and her husband in just three years. And she found herself uh, this huge fortune that had been the family's in her hands. Uh, and she could do whatever she wanted with it. And what she did uh, was unique, in my opinion. She decided not to get ever married again. She never had children. She decided to take up a monastic life and she dedicated herself to charitable works. So she spent this huge amount of money uh, for building orphanages and shelters and teaching uh, the poor a job and helping prostitutes and especially women. We are at a time in Greek history when uh, uh, Greek is under Ottoman rule, Turkish rule. So they are not independent and they are treated in a brutish way, especially women uh, um, were enslaved and uh, uh, abused very often. So she took care of these women and she, because of all her charitable work, she was uh, named a saint of the Greek Orthodox Church. She's Saint Philote. She's worshipped to this day as Saint Philote. And the name means a friend of God. And I like this story. The museum is also dedicated to her given it was her house. And I think, uh, especially given the time, the historical time when she lived, the fact that she was such a philanthropist and a feminist uh, was really unique. So it is an interesting story to go uh, check out uh, in your next, uh, during your next Athens visit. Uh, within the neighborhood of Plaka, we are still there. There is a tiny area that is called Anafiotica that not everybody knows about, uh, um, thankfully in a way, it's still out uh, of uh, the main uh, touristic routes, and I hope it stays this way because it's very typical, and I hope it uh, retains its authenticity. When you walk through the cobbled alleys and, and narrow streets of Anafiotica, you feel like you've been teletransported to a Greek island. You, you don't feel like you're in Athens anymore. It doesn't look like you're in a metropolis anymore. It looks like this. And it, of course, there is a reason behind it. And the reason is that in the 1800s, uh, lots of workers uh, coming from the Greek islands uh, were moved to Athens uh, uh, because of all the restoration works that were going on throughout the city. So they were employed uh, for these restorations. Uh, and this is the area of Athens where they went to live. And it is said that they missed the landscape that they were used to so much 
that they decided to recreate it by building the houses and the lanes between the houses in the style of their ori original islands. And so, again, it looks like you're not in the city anymore. I like to get lost in Anafiotica uh, because maybe you can tell in this photo, at the very top you see rocks, and that is the Acropolis. So you can't really, really get lost. And it's beautiful just to wander around and uh, enjoy and take all in uh, the atmosphere that this uh, lovely little neighbor ha neighborhood has. Now that we have finished uh, our uh, look to the city of Athens, uh, I thought we would be ready for lunch, uh, our first pit stop. And I chose a tiny little cafe within the neighborhood of Plaka called Gyazemi Cafe. Gyazemi in Greek means jasmine. So they have uh, beautifully decorated the outside of the cafe with these tiny lights and jasmine growing on the walls. And they have scattered uh, tables and chairs uh, on the steps outside their door. So we could have an outdoor lunch. And as to what we could order, um, a very, a, a very classic staple of Greek cuisine, the Greek salad. Um, if you eat it in Greece, maybe you've had it in your life. Maybe you've had it in the States. I've had it in Italy. I've, have it, I've had it in other places in, in my life. But let me tell you, when you eat it in Greece, it has a totally different flavor. It's fantastic. The tomatoes that have been growing in the Greek sun with the Greek salty air, the sweetness of the red onions, the raw red onions, uh, uh, the freshness of the cucumber, if you like it, not everybody digs it. And uh, of course, the Greek olives, uh, the ever present feta cheese, this white block that you see on top, it's not tofu. God help us, it's, uh, it's goat's cheese. It's the typical Greek cheese and all sprinkled with oregano, with the beautiful Grecian oregano. So it is uh, an experience to have a Greek, it's not any salad, but if you're a little more hungry than that, then you could choose souvlaki, another very classic Greek dish, dish nowadays. Very simple, it's skewers of usually poultry uh, chicken, but they could, uh, could also be pork or lamb, lots of lamb in Greek cuisine, barbecued and served with maybe some tzatziki, some sauces, some fresh uh, sauces, yogurty sauces as the ones that they make. Um, if you are like me and you like trying different smaller portions of different things that you might want to uh, give a try at a dolmas or dolmadakia, these are vine leaves wrapped around uh, a filling of usually rice, uh, as we see in this photo, sometimes meat, ground meat, but usually rice uh, that is all spiced up with different spices and herbs. So really, really good. Or my very absolute favorite, Kurukito Kefedes, a really difficult name to pronounce for a very simple yet delicious dish. These are grated zucchini patties. They get mixed up with uh, crumbles of uh, goat feta cheese and fresh uh, mint leaves that get chopped up with the zucchini. And then they get, the patties get formed and they get deep fried. So as you know, anything that gets deep fried is really good. And these are really fantastic. So now that we have, uh, um, also um, taken care of our appetite, so let's move on to our stop. A very short way away is the site of Delphi. And to talk about Delphi, I need you to bear with me for a second uh, and excuse if I have to talk a little bit about ancient Greek religion, because Delphi is an ancient sacred site uh, and it will be useful to, you know, just a, a reminder of uh, uh, the, um, the main aspects of ancient uh, Greek religion. As you might know already, it was a polytheistic religion, meaning they had multiple divinities, not as uh, Christians uh, or uh, Muslims do or Hebrews do. These divinities had human appearance. They shared uh, uh, some human traits uh, as vices and virtues and passions uh, with humans. They were immortals and they lived in Mount Olympus, the sacred mountain for ancient Greeks. Now, all the stories, uh, and they are a lot, regarding uh, these uh, uh, divinities, these entities, the way they were, they were born, uh, who married who, who um, fought with who, the competitions between them, but also all the intricacies of their relationships with the human beings, because they did meet with human beings, uh, 
all of this is what we call mythology. Now, again, very shortly, the main gods were 12, the 12 Olympians, and I included six here to be briefer. Uh, they were Zeus, the father of all the gods, the most powerful god of all, who reigned over uh, the um, Olympus mountain, together with his wife, uh, goddess Hera. They are pictured with a tiny animal at their side because they each had a sacred animal, as we saw before with Athena and the owl. Then we have, again, famously Poseidon that we talked about before, and Athena, the favorite uh, daughter of uh, Zeus. And then uh, a couple of opposites. Uh, Dionysus, the god of wine and inhibition and partying all night long, letting loose uh, and, having, uh, uh, and having a good time. And again, his opposite, Apollo, the god of uh, the arts, uh, the light, uh, equilibrium and balance uh, and beauty. And Apollo is the god that we want to talk about uh, when visiting the site of Delphi. Now, Delphi is a super important site for ancient Greeks. Uh, it was the main holy place for them in, uh, in the whole world. Uh, it has a legendary origin as everything in ancient Greece. They explained everything with mythology. And the story of the site of Delphi goes that uh, the mother of Apollo was one of Zeus's mistresses. Zeus was very famously unfaithful, unfaithful to his wife Hera who was famously jealous, famously jealous and tried everything in her power to break up the different liaisons and dalliances that Zeus uh, always was having with other women, women, mortals, immortals, uh, goddesses, nymphs, uh, he, he wasn't picky. So this particular mistress, uh, uh, Hera, um, his wife, uh, discovered that this mistress was pregnant with twins. Uh, and she sent after her a monster to follow her everywhere she went uh, so that nobody would grant this woman uh, shelter to give birth uh, at some point uh, to deliver the two twins. So finally, she was able to deliver them on an island uh, and uh, Apollo and his twin sister Demeter, the goddess Demeter, were born. And the legend goes that Apollo, at only one year of age, uh, already wanted to avenge uh, the sufferings caused to his mother by this monster, went in search of it, found it on this spot in Delphi, and killed it. Now, the monster was a serpent dragon monster named Python. So Apollo killed it on this spot, wanted a temple raised in his honor where he had killed the monster, buried the body of the monster underneath the temple. In this image, we see the ruins of the temple of Apollo and placed priestesses that would care for this temple that took their name from the name of the monster. So the monster was Python. They were the Pythonesses. And the Pythonesses had the gift of prophecy because Apollo was also the god of prophecies and foreseeing the future. So the people believed this. Uh, they came to the Oracle of Delphi to ask uh, uh, the priestesses uh, who were the uh, link between mortals and the god Apollo for any decision they had to make. No decision was made without uh, consulting the Oracle at Delphi. People, especially kings and uh, uh, generals of the army and aristocrats traveled from very far away from the uh, the outermost corners of the Greek world uh, to come to this spot before taking any decision. They would ask the priestess and they believed that the priestess would inhale the gases emanating from the body of the monster buried beneath the temple and these gases would uh, help her get into a trance uh, that would be the state required to get in touch with uh, um, Apollo's mind and read his mind and give uh, an answer. The answers were always very cryptic and mysterious, very difficult to interpret, 
But again, the people believed they were true and real. And whenever things in reality didn't match what had been uh, uh, prophesied by the priestesses, the people believed that it was their fault for not reading the signs uh, and the answer of the God right. The site has many still standing monuments. This is the uh, huge theater that was built at the site uh, for the plays uh, uh, done in honor of the god uh, during the festivities done in honor of the god. Uh, and so it is a fantastic, very scenographic place to visit uh, with uh, so many different ruins uh, to check out. Uh, this image is not beautiful, but it really gives you an idea of how the site uh, develops on the side of a mountain. So it is very steep and you can, from the lower level where the ruins of the temple are, you can ascend to the level of to the next level, which is the theater. And then with a very steep, a little longer hike, you get all the way to the top level where you see the stadium, uh, because the festivities done in honor of the God also entailed games, uh, such as uh, the Olympic Games, uh, but these were the Delphic, uh, the Delphic festivities, the Delphic Games. Uh, Again, Delphi was the navel of the world uh, for the Greeks. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it is a place that has been studied by archeologists and still is. They did find uh, uh, a pocket of uh, um, subterranean gas underneath it. So it was true that the priestesses uh, were inhebriated by the gases and went into an actual high and a trance. Uh, that's why they mumbled mysterious words. And on the, on the walls of one of the temples of Delphi, archeologists found uh, this inscription which was probably the most important advice uh, of all. Know yourself. Now from Delphi, we start uh, finally our island hopping. I'm excited to show you all the islands. Uh, and we move on to the Ionian island. Uh, first, we see Zakynthos. This is a view of Zakynthos city, the main uh, town on the island. These are not big islands, uh, so not very many towns, uh, usually small. This being the main one uh, is the biggest one with the harbor. This is an example of the waters that Zakynthos has to offer. It's breathtaking. And there is one beach uh, specifically that is very famous, uh, Navagio Beach. Uh, or the beach uh, uh, of the shipwreck, because there is this relic uh, on the beach. This happened in the 1980s, so it's not an ancient relic, it's a modern times one, it happens 40 years ago. Uh, this uh, uh, ship, during a storm one night, was passing in front of this very closed up, very tiny bay, and uh, got pushed ashore by the by the storm, and there it remained on the sand of the be on the beach. Navagio means uh, shipwreck, so that's why they call it also shipwreck. It is a beautiful beach that gets on the different colors. The rock gets the different colors of the light throughout the day. It is reachable with boats, of course. So from the front you can arrive. But there is also a panoramic point that has been arranged. And please excuse the quality, the real poor quality of the photo, but I couldn't find really none other. But this is to show you that there is this panoramic terrace that overlooks into the bay right on top of the cliff. And it is, maybe you can tell, it's suspended in midair. So I have a lot of trouble with height. I suffer from vertigo, so I could never, even if it's concrete, I could never step onto it. But I know Mara is very adventurous and she does make people do these types of things on tour. So prepare yourselves. Also, I have another tiny suggestion for Mara. You will all excuse me if you will be in Greece with her next, because this is something else that you might want to arrange, Mara, for your next trip to Greece. Uh, you can uh, walk on a line across the bay and enjoy the colors of the water underneath you, of course. I will never do it. If I'm your tour director, I'm not coming. Uh, Zakynthos uh, is uh, very rugged. It has these uh, cliffs that have been molded by the sea and the winds uh, throughout time, giving it this very rugged aspect. And of course, they form caves. They are called the blue caves for the color that the stone walls take on with the reflection of these uh, transparent and beautiful waters. So the blue caves, of course, are visitable. 
There are also two smaller islets, really, not islands, off Zakynthos that pertain to the island of Zakynthos, where nobody lives. They are really just tiny rocks, but they are beautiful to visit. One of these is Cameo Island that you see in the photo now, and the other is Maratunisi. Maratunisi um, is very much protected. It is part of a biomarine national park. So you cannot sleep on Maratonisi. You cannot uh, uh, leave the beachy tongue uh, that you see that protrudes from the island. You can get there by boat. There are uh, ferries organized daily or your private boat if you happen to have one. But you have to stop uh, in the waters and you can bathe in the sea, but then you have to leave uh, by nightfall. The reason why this island is part of the National Marine Park is that the Ionian Sea in general, but specifically the waters around the island of Zakynthos, are home to two endangered species that you might encounter if you go to Zakynthos. One is the loggerhead sea turtle. The loggerhead sea turtle is one of the most endangered species on the planet. They do travel uh, great lengths during their migration. So they are found uh, in other places in the world, not just here. But the Zakynthos uh, uh, beaches are their favorite place uh, where to lay their eggs. So this is where they reproduce. And uh, if you are lucky as I once was when I was a kid and my parents took me, if uh, you get there in early September, and if you are willing to wake up at the crack of dawn and get on one of these beaches, you might see hatchlings coming out of their eggs and walking with lots of difficulties because the sand of the beach for them, it's dunes of a huge desert, but walking all the way to the sea and then making their way into the water. It is something that it gives me the chills just thinking about it, back at it. I included in the links a video of this happening, so you might get an idea of the emotion that one feels if witnessing this happening. The other species that is protected within the marine park is the monk seal. They too like Zakynthos to reproduce, but they choose the caves and not the beaches, which are a little more protected. The monk seal is probably the most endangered species in the world. Uh, there are only a few hundreds uh, left uh, um, in the world, so it is very important to protect them. We leave Zakynthos and its beautiful cliffy beaches to get to our next uh, island, which is Kefalonia. Kefalonia, too, has uh, some lovely towns overlooking the water. It is very picturesque. Uh, it has all these uh, uh, different color painted houses. Argostoli, this town that you see in this photo, is the main town. We have also Assos, uh, which is uh, lovely uh, to visit. And of course, it has also gorgeous waters driving. Driving along uh, the coastline road uh, is fantastic in Kefalonia because uh, you see it well in this picture. You are right next to the cliffs uh, and uh, the, the blue sea, so you get to see all the different shades of the sea. Myrtle Beach, uh, this very white, beautiful white sandy beach uh, is the most famous one on the island, uh, but there are plenty more to visit. And Kefalonia also has caves uh, as well as Zakynthos, Melisani being the most famous one of all where this is the water. It's like floating on a glass surface. It's, it's incredible to visit Melisani Cave. It's a very touristic thing to do, unfortunately. So it is an organized thing. You cannot get in by yourself uh, and you can just spend a few minutes in the cave, but it is still something worth doing in my opinion. <clears throat> uh, Kefalonia, and also to interrupt a little bit the, the, the number of beautiful beaches and sea views uh, in our slides tonight. Kefalonia also has uh, uh, another side, uh, another importance to its uh, history, something that happened closer to us in time. We are not talking about ancient Greece uh, um, for this. We are talking about the Second World War. The Second World War is when uh, Greece was occupied by Italians. We were uh, allied with the Nazis, uh, stupid us, and uh, at the very beginning of the war, the Italian army invaded and occupied uh, Greece, both the mainland and the islands. So on uh, the Ionian islands and on Kefalonia especially, lots of Italian soldiers uh, took up residence. Uh, 
uh, it was a very quiet occupation, not many battles. Greece was never a battlefield where different armies met. So these Italians, uh, they started living the life of the people of these islands. They started uh, getting along with the uh, inhabitants of the islands. They also started marrying into the families uh, living on the islands. So they were living kind of a peaceful life uh, uh, in wartime and getting along well with uh, the locals. But at some point, uh, we signed an armistice with the Allies, and Hitler was not happy that the Italians would go over the other side. When this happened, uh, the day after, he uh, commanded uh, uh, his troops, his German troops, uh, to invade Greece uh, and kill all the Italian soldiers they could find. Uh, because he didn't want them to go fight for uh, the other side. So we are seeing just a group of the Italian soldiers on Kefalonia at the time. There were more or less 10,000, so this is a very small group that we see. But uh, they, they did, uh, unfortunately, they were there during what later on became known as the massacre of Kefalonia. Because uh, uh, in the turn of just a few days, between the initial fighting, uh, because the Italians resisted, uh, the, uh, the killings uh, afterwards that the Germans perpetrated, and all the ones that weren't killed but sent to concentration camps and never returned, uh, we talk about almost 10,000 deaths. So the death toll was the highest of Italian soldiers killed by Germans uh, during World War II. This is a little bit of a grim story. Why am I telling you this? Because uh, there is a beautiful book that has been written about this story that was also turned into a famous movie, uh, kind of recent. I think it's not more than 10 years old, maybe less. You might have heard of it, Captain Corelli's Mandolin. Uh, it features Nicolas Cage and Penelope Cruz. And this, the film tells the story that I just told you. So Nicolas Cage is an Italian soldier in the movie who is stationed in Kefalonia during the war. And uh, it tells this story from his own uh, unique uh, individual perspective. So it's a beautiful movie. I do suggest it if you haven't uh, watched it yet. Lastly, from uh, the northern side of Kefalonia, from its shores, uh, you get a glimpse uh, of, well, you actually get a beautiful view of uh, the island that is next to it, very tiny but very lovely, the famous Ithaca, the seat uh, of King Ulysses uh, uh, that Homer talked about in his Iliad and Odyssey. Ithaca is also another worthy place to visit, but I couldn't put them all in. For a very brief stop, uh, a refreshing stop, I'm imagining us in a, on a sweltering August day visiting all these uh, sites in Greece. So, so we need something to refresh us and give us a little energy for the last two stops of our trip. So the very typical thing that you would have in Greece in this occasion is the frappe or freddo cappuccino. This was something that the Greeks invented by chance in the 1950s. And it's a mixture of instant coffee and cold water shaken in a way that forms a foam. There's no milk in it. Uh, sometimes nowadays there are versions uh, with milk added to it, but usually it's black and it can be either sweetened or not, not sugared. So this is something that they drink all day long at every moment everyone drinks it in greece everyone every day all year long when i say everyone i really mean everyone everyone has a frappe in her hand in their hands now we leave uh, the beautiful ionian islands and from kefalonia we make a very long stop all the way to santorini island now santorini here is seen from above in a satellite picture and I wanted to show you this image because uh, there is a reason why Santorini has this very peculiar shape. Santorini was once a volcano and this area that I have encircled in red was all uh, out of the water. It was all emerged. But what happened is that at some point uh, there was a huge, uh, terrible eruption of the volcano and the top of the cone got submerged it collapsed into the sea, leaving only its borders. 
So again, this photo that maybe now makes more sense. Uh, you see, in fact, uh, it remains only the, the, the bigger part on the right uh, and the smaller part to the left. Uh, and you see how their inner borders have very high ragged cliffs, uh, whereas the outer part uh, is uh, very sweetly degrading towards the ocean. And this is why, because again, the, the middle part uh, uh, collapsed, uh, came down, but was actually part of a bigger mountain. So Santorini has a volcanic origin. Uh, this is one of the craters that can be visited nowadays. This is on the youngest, let's say, of the islands uh, that, uh, um, of, the, of the parts of the land that became islands uh, after the eruption. And so you get within this bay with a boat uh, and you can walk, you can hike all along uh, the circular crater. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful hike to do if you're, if you're interested in nature. Uh, the fact that Santorini has a volcanic origin also is the reason behind the coloring of the stone. Uh, you go from these uh, whitish, uh, reddish, pinkish uh, cliffs uh, all the way to the black sand beaches. Uh, Vlihada Beach is one of the most famous uh, where the sand is actually black because it's pumice. It's a volcanic uh, stone. Uh, pulverized, so it is a very fine sand, but it retains the color with this amazing, stunning background of uh, cliffs um, eaten up and molded uh, by the elements, the sea of the, of the, the salt of the sea and the wind uh, throughout times. Um, Santorini also has a couple of uh, towns or villages on the island that you can visit. The main uh, most famous one is probably Ia, I know it's written Oya, but it's read, uh, it's, it, you, you read it Ia, and uh, Ia is very famous. It's probably one of the most Instagrammed pictures, uh, Instagrammed places in the world uh, with its famous blue domes uh, and white uh, uh, painted buildings. Uh, it's also an Instagram, uh, um, an Instagrammer's dream because of the different colors that it takes on uh, throughout the different uh, moments uh, of the day and the night. Um, the flowers are also fantastic in Santorini because of the contrast between the blue of the sea and of the domes uh, and the whiteness. Let me tell you, these pictures, I know they looked retouched, but they're not. They're not photoshopped. These are the actual colors. It looks fake even when you are there. So these are the, the typical uh, colors that you would uh, encounter walking through the streets of Ia. The Bungamvillea especially are used to frame uh, the doors, uh, the, the entrances to people's homes. Uh, and of course, they make a beautiful effect. But Santorini is not only beaches and cliffs. Uh, there's also some archaeology on the island. Uh, and it's not any other archaeology. Akrotiri is the name of the archaeological site that you can visit also nicknamed the Pompeii of the Aegean Sea, uh, because uh, archaeologists uh, have found the remains uh, intact of uh, a huge city that once was uh, on the island in ancient times. Uh, it is said that they excavated for now only 5% of what there is uh, still to unearth. Uh, so it's really a huge site already as it is. Uh, let's imagine when they will have the 100% excavated. And also, let me point out something that to me is mind blowing. This city was kept so well by the ashes uh, of the eruption that destroyed uh, the island of Santorini. Um, exactly as it happened in Pompeii with the eruption, the ashes from the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Now, the eruption happened 1,600 years before Christ, okay, so a millennia and a half before Christ. And a millennia and a half, be so the city for sure uh, was alive before that time, maybe two millennia before Christ or 1,800 year years before Christ. And at that time, in such ancient times, these are the decorations of their walls. These are the wall paintings that you can see in the different houses that archaeologists have found and excavated in the Akrotiri site. So my suggestion when visiting Santorini is to enjoy the beautiful views, the sea, the hike on the crater and the wine that they produce on the island, but also uh, leave some time for this uh, breathtaking site. They say it's one of the most important archaeological sites in history. 
Leaving Santorini, we move on to our next uh, and final stop, the island of Icaria, closer to the border with Turkey. Icaria is another island in the Aegean Sea with beautiful views. Um, it takes its name from uh, a myth, uh, from an ancient Greek myth. We see it depicted in this uh, painting by Marc Chagall. Uh, the, the, the kid named Icarus famously uh, donned on a pair of wings that had been manufactured by his dad. Uh, his dad was the architect uh, who built the famous labyrinth to keep in the Minotaur monster, but then he and his son were locked in the labyrinth as well. So to escape the labyrinth, uh, Daedalus, the father of Icarus, uh, manufactured the two pairs of wings uh, made out of feathers and wax. And he told his son, be careful, don't fly too close to the sun because this, the, the heat will melt the wax and you will fall out of the sky. And Icarus said yes, but he was an adolescent and he wanted to do, in, to do it in his own way and uh, he flew too close to the sun and his wings melted and he precipitated in the Aegean Sea, dying of the fall. So the island of Icaria, it is said to take on its name from the myth uh, I found this picture of this uh, beautiful graffiti uh, representing Icarus flying on a wall in a street uh, in one of the towns in Icaria Island. It has uh, its share of uh, gorgeous, uh, breathtaking beaches, uh, and uh, it has its share of lovely picturesque towns. I know this looks a little bit like Palm Springs, uh, but it's actually Evdios uh, in, on Icaria. Rajes is another lovely town to visit, and Agios Kirikos uh, is the main town uh, of the island. Um, now, this is uh, kind of any other uh, island uh, that you could find in Greece. Uh, Greece uh, has 6,000 islands. By the way, if you're interested, only 224 are inhabited. The rest uh, is uh, inhabited, uninhabited. So if you want to buy an island uh, or go explore one that has never been seen by anyone else, uh, you might wander through the Aegean Sea and the Ionian Sea. So what is the peculiarity of Ikaria? Why did I choose it? I chose it for two reasons. First of all, I wanted to um, suggest something that it's not so famous. Santorini, you probably have heard of Santorini, but uh, Icaria is uh, less uh, on the touristic routes. And so I wanted to talk about something that might sound new to you. And the other reason is that Icaria is part uh, of a very elite cluster of places around the world uh, called uh, the Blue Zones. Uh, the other ones being Sardinia in Italy, Loma Linda in California, uh, Nicoya in Costa Rica, Okinawa, uh, Okinawa Island in Japan, and finally Ikaria in Greece. What are the Blue Zones? The Blue Zones are places in the world that have been under study for the past uh, 10 years, more or less, uh, by one specialist, but another couple of professors around the world helping him, because these, uh, um, these professors, they found out that in these places, people live longer than anyone else on the planet. So they have a really high factor of longevity, extreme longevity. Sardinia, and a specific area within the island of Sardinia, is the place with the highest number of ultra centarian people in the world. So people who live to reach 100 and go over 100 in good health, of course. Um, this... Uh, uh, this uh, uh, person is an inhabitant of Ikaria. His name is Stamatis Moraitis. He was one of the subjects uh, who participated in this study. And this photo was taken when he was 97 years old uh, while he was working in his vineyard uh, on Ikaria. So these people not only live to be the uh, most, uh, uh, the oldest people in the world, uh, but they also have a very low um, rate of heart diseases, dementia, Alzheimer's, cancer. So they, they live long and healthful life all the way to the end, they stay sharp and healthy. So these, uh, um, these professors, uh, they wanted to study the why, the reasons behind these uh, diff people living in, in such uh, uh, far away places from each other. Do they have anything in common in their lifestyle maybe? Yes. 
It is all written in this book, if you're interested, The Blue Zones, written by the main uh, person who studied this phenomenon, Dan Butner, uh, Lessons for Living Longer, from the people who've lived the longest. And he did identify why, uh, why this happens. There are six factors in his opinion. Family comes first for these uh, uh, cultures, for these people. Almost no one smokes in these societies. They adopted a semi-vegetarian diet, not, not on, by choice, but because it's their tradition. They do moderate, regular physical activity every day of their life. So they move around a lot. They feel socially useful all the way to the end of their life. So even for the oldest of people, there is still a role in society and they feel they are useful to the end and they commonly consume legumes. These are the factors in common with all these places in the world. We are going to talk about one, we are going to concentrate on their diet. Now, their diet uh, is uh, basically what we call the Mediterranean diet. Uh, and this is something that doctors, nutritionists have discovered uh, many moons ago. The Mediterranean diet apparently is the healthiest one that you can adopt uh, in your, as a nutrition plan, not as a slimming diet, as a nutrition plan for life uh, in your habits. And what does it consist of? Cereals, uh, non-refined cereals, so whole wheat, bread, pasta, rice, olive oil, put everywhere, Prefer it, preferably raw, not cooked, not heat up, um, fresh fruits and fresh veggies. And this should be the staples that you eat every day. And then once or twice a week, you can add fish, white meat, so poultry, dairy, milk, eggs, uh, cheese, and butter, nuts, dried fruits, and sweets. And I'm sorry to tell you, because, and I'm sorry for myself too, because I'm a lover, but uh, uh, only once or twice a month, uh, the very top of this pyramid, red meat and salt. So again, they make up for the pyramid of the Mediterranean diet with at the bottom what you should consume more often and at the very top what you should reduce the consume of as, as much as possible. At the base of the pyramid, lots of water, and always lots of water all throughout your day and sports, so physical activity. A tough life, I know. Um, because we ended up talking about the Mediterranean diet, I thought we could also end up our ideal day in Greece so that we spent together in Greece with a lovely dinner uh, at an outdoor table overlooking the water of the beautiful Grecian Sea. I do have my bonus that I talked about at the beginning, the surprise that I promised, which is this. Since uh, space and traveling through space is not a problem when you do virtual tours, uh, let's go back to the area where Athens is. Uh, the very tip of the, um, of the rocky area where Athens is, uh, is this cape called the Cape Sunion, where there is a temple and it overlooks the sea. And the view is already beautiful as it is in this photo. But I would like to take you at sunset. And once the sun has set, I would be wanting to offer you this view. Uh, this is not photoshopped, believe me. This happens really, and it's the August full moon. The Greeks uh, uh, have a festival to, um, to celebrate this event. So every year it's on a different day, of course, because it depends on when the full moon is happening. This year, if you're curious, uh, it, it, it will fall on the 3rd of August. So ideally, our tour has happened on the 3rd of August. And on the night of the full moon, you see it rising behind the temple. Uh, and it's, 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 a phen it's a phenomenon, it's an astronomy phenomenon for which the, the moon is really, really close uh, uh, to the earth at that, at that time. And specifically, you see it well in Greece. One last bit of uh, uh, bonus, in my opinion. I hope it's useful. These are things that I couldn't include for time limits, but that I would have loved to, and that I think you should check out if you're planning on uh, having a trip done in Greece. Uh, all the things that I would have loved to show you. Thessaloniki, the city of Thessaloniki, the site of Epidaurus, uh, the tomb of Philip, father of Alexander the Great is fantastic. Uh, Mycenae, the city of Mycenae, Samos and Lesbos, uh, Meteora and its mid-air monasteries, uh, the islands of Corfu, Ithaca and Delos, uh, 
everything on the island of Crete, uh, Olympia, the ancient site of the Olympic Games, the Corinth Canal, and Stavros Niarchos in Athens. Now, I know um, it's a, already been a very long presentation. I did this slide because if you are interested, when you can, when you see the regist the registration of the of the event of tonight, maybe tomorrow, you can write these down. So you see the spelling of the places, and you can write them down. Um, I found out while I was putting together the slides uh, that uh, your co-citizen Tom Hanks uh, is very fond of Greece. Uh, he married an, an American actress and producer who has Greek heritage. Her mom was Greek. And I found out that she feels very strongly about her Greek uh, roots. So they have a house in Greece that they use for their holidays. They visit every year. Uh, Tom Hanks fell in love uh, with Greece, apparently. His t-shirt reads, take me to Ellas, take me to Greece. And uh, in uh, December last year, he was uh, awarded the honorary citizenship of Greece. And uh, in January this year, at the ceremony of the Golden Globe Awards, uh, he was awarded the, um, the prize to his career, the Cecile B. DeMille Prize. And uh, when asked by a uh, reporter, a Greek reporter, about uh, uh, his love for Greece, uh, these are his words, and I couldn't have put it better. Greece is a haven. It's good for the soul. He says it's a healing place. So I hope uh, I have uh, um, made your desire to visit this uh, beautiful, lovely country stronger. Efkaristo, as we would say in Greece. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. That was just amazing. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for joining us and sharing so many interesting and fun facts about Greece. I've been several times and I learned so much on this tour and I'm sure everybody else has. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to go to a Q&A session now. So please enter all of your questions in the questions tab and Elena will start to look through them at this point so that she can address them um, for you. I know that we have run long. If there's any reason why you have to jump off, please know that we are recording this and you can access the recording at another time through girltraveltours.com on the virtual tour tab. Um, as you could imagine, Elena could probably have done this tour physically with us in no time because she knows all of these facts and they come off the top of her head. But obviously in a virtual climate, she has to do a lot of research and preparation to show us it through pictures. Um, so I'm, I'm just so thankful that you have given us all of that attention. Your presentation took a lot of time and I understand that and, and we thank you for that. Uh, let us all try to show our appreciation by sending a tip. No matter how small or big, all tips are appreciated. Um, you can use Venmo, PayPal, or even write a check if you don't have online apps. And please know that 100% of all tips go straight to Elena. This is not something I am doing for profit. I am doing this to keep travel alive for all of us and to support the tour directors who are not working at the time. If you need any information that, um, that you don't see on the chat, I have uh, posted the, the information on the chat. I'm also gonna share my screen right now so that you see it and you could take a screenshot of it um, with your phone or on your computer. But essentially, um, if you do have uh, questions, you'll see where to send tipping. Um, and I can also send my address again if you need to send a check. Okay, so um, I wanted to just reiterate that without these tours, without the attendees on these tours, they would not be as popular and we would not be doing them. So I wanna thank all of you for coming out today. Um, we will have other tours coming up and you can um, access the recordings of the tours that we've already done. So I'm going to hand this back over. Elena, are you ready to take it with the questions? We do have a lot of questions coming in. Um, I'm gonna put myself back on mute so that you can take the questions and we can move forward with the, with the Q&A. Okay. Yes, we do have a lot of questions. I was looking through them. First of all, Christy, I hope I answered your initial question. And uh, um, 
I am just going to read them out loud uh, uh, in order. How far is Greece and what time is it there? And we also have uh, someone else, uh, Dineen Taylor. How far is the air distance from Washington, DC? So two answers, uh, uh, one answer for both questions. Uh, um, from uh, the east coast of the US, so let's say from the Philly area, where I know Mara is, uh, um, you are six hours away from me, so seven hours away from uh, uh, Greece. Uh, so Greece is one hour ahead of Italy, so seven hours in total. So now, right now for me is uh, uh, half past midnight. In Athens, it's half past 1 a.m. So that's the time. As to how long it would take to fly there, again, from the east coast of the US, uh, more or less, uh, it would be an eight hour flight. Mm -hmm. Of course, way longer from the East Coast, uh, you would have to break it up, uh, um, changing connecting flights in, uh, uh, on the East Coast. Then we have Marianne, if someone could only go to Athens and one other place in Greece, so what would you recommend for the other place? Uh, I knew this was, would come, I knew, and it's super difficult to, to, to answer. Um, I would say the other place uh, uh, is a place that I didn't, that I couldn't include in my presentation, and it, it's the island of Crete. It's the biggest island in the uh, archipelago of Greece, and it's south of mainland Greece. Um, Go, go, it's fantastic. <laughs> you will fall in love. I have family, this is Bobby. I have family from the island of Ore. Where is that located? Bobby, you find me, I'm prepared. I have no idea where Ore is or if the spelling is right, I'm sorry. Um, I will look it up though. And if I do find an answer, I will send it to Mara so that she can send it to you, okay? Where is Corfu? Ronda asked, where is Corfu? Corfu is uh, uh, within the Ionian Islands, so close to uh, Kefalonia and Zakynthos that we've seen together. When is the best, most comfortable time to visit? If you can, and I know not everybody can, but if you can avoid the summer months, uh, it gets uh, super hot. Mara can uh, witness to this. Uh, it gets super hot, especially in the cities uh, where you don't have the relief uh, of the seashore. Uh, on the Acropolis, sometimes they shut it down because of the sheer heat on top of the Acropolis and people fainting. So if you could go in the springtime or the early fall, those are two very mild uh, weathered months uh, or times of the year. And, uh, and, and they are less touristic, so less people around, so you would enjoy it very much. How old are the ruins on the Athens Acropolis? You're right, I didn't explain it well. Um, they were, what we see, to, so the Acropolis has been a sacred site uh, since uh, a millennia and a half before Christ, way before the Parthenon was built. But the monuments that we see nowadays uh, uh, are the ones that were left uh, from classical times. So fifth century before Christ, uh, 450 years before Christ, more or less, is when they were built. Name of the Argentinian artist, Marta Minujin, is the Argentinian artist who did the Parthenon of Books in Castel. Where did the books come from again? This is very interesting. I, I didn't say it before. Uh, she asked uh, of her public to donate uh, if they had any books uh, that they knew were under censorship in some countries in the world. Uh, so the books came from all over the world. People, people started sell, uh, uh, sending millions of books. She couldn't use them all. And uh, it's a very good, nice example of uh, participation in art uh, that it's happening so often nowadays in contemporary art. When were the structures of the Acropolis built and how long did it take? Again, they were built uh, mid fifth century before Christ. Uh, and as to how long it took, we don't, or at least I don't know specifically, uh, but not that long, not that long. In uh, 10, 15 years, what we saw was done. Do people often visit Greece? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, tourism is one of the main industries in Greece. It makes up for 15% of their uh, gross income as a nation. What was that area called with the former mosque? I am wondering about the lines on the ground. The area is called Monastiraki. Um, I, I would have to look back at the picture to, to realize what you're talking about with the lines, sorry. What kind of food do people sell in Greece? 
what I talked about. Uh, really, the ingredients that I mentioned for the Mediterranean diet, those are it. Uh, they have uh, the best olives in the world, uh, black, never green. Kalamata is a famous place that produces olives. Uh, they produce wines, uh, but they are very pe peculiar because of the climate and the saltiness of the air that breathes uh, through the vineyards, so not everybody likes them. They produce a couple of liquors, uh, such as ouzo, that is made with anise seeds, I hate it, but maybe if you like it, it's fantastic. Uh, they have lots of uh, lamb in their meat dishes. They have goat cheese uh, in abundance. They eat it even for breakfast. And uh, lots and lots of uh, veggies uh, done in stews, in pies, uh, raw in salads. So all sorts of ways of cooking veggies. What is your favorite dessert? I am not a dessert person, thank God. I only like the other half of the universe of food. So give me pizza and I will be yours, but dessert leaves me, it leaves me indifferent. When and how will we get the slides? This is one from Mara. She says, I didn't get the slides from Ireland. Sure, so all of the presentations are available at girltraveltours.com. And you can um, get you can view all of the presentations there. Right. So the next is: Would you recommend seeing Thessaloniki in one day? Uh, yes and no. Yes, it's doable, absolutely. But um, I would never recommend for any city in the world. Really, I wouldn't recommend a one-day visit. It's just too rushed. It's it's too neurotic, and you get stressed. In my opinion, this is how I, I like to travel, so maybe you're different, but I would, uh, I would spend a night. So you can also see it at night, you can, have, uh, you can dine out uh, and, and also enjoy the nightlife and see it uh, in, uh, at dark. Um, so yeah, that's what I would do. What are the most popular islands now to visit? Uh, Santorini is definitely one of the most famous ones uh, uh, in the same area. So in the Aegean Sea, Mykonos, Paros uh, are very, very famous for tourists. Um, Crete, uh, some place, Crete is very big. It's not as tiny as the islands that we saw. Some parts of it, yes, are famous, especially for some archaeological ruins, but it's still very um, savage, let's say, especially in the southern part, so not many tourists. And for the Ionian, uh, Ionian islands, Kefalonia, Zakynthos, uh, Corfu, very, very touristic, very touristic. Jennifer, I want to return to Greece uh, for a sailing holiday. Oh, wow, around the islands. Do you have a tour like this? Um, oh, this is a very specific question. Um, the tour operator that I met Mara through, EF, doesn't. Uh, they do have tours of mainland Greece that end with a couple days uh, in the islands, but it's not a sailing uh, holiday. So I would suggest looking up other private tour uh, companies or uh, you can uh, design it yourself uh, and just rent the boat uh, with the skipper, of course, with the person <laughs> maneuvering the boat, but it's absolutely doable. And there's plenty of opportunities to do this in Greece because many people do. Uh, Jasmine, what is the recommended amount of time to visit Greece to truly get a sense of the history, land, food, and more? as many as you can. <laughs> you will never get bored, especially because uh, given all the islands that Greece has uh, and how spread the mainland is, uh, there are so many differences between the different places that each time you go, if you don't go back to the same spots, it will feel like you're visiting a new country, even though you will recognize the food and the language and some things, uh, but the scenery will, be, will always have something new. So I would say at least three. If I have to give a number, I would say at least three. It's a little bit off, to, off the top of my head. I, I'm, I'm not sure why, but I would say three. In terms of lodging, this is Olivia. In terms of lodging, is it best to stay in hotel or what are some other options? Homestay, for example. So homestay is uh, definitely doable, uh, especially in seaside places. So on the islands or on the coast, uh, they have what they call studios which are not too big apartments, um, very Spartan. They, are, they don't have luxuries usually, but they are also very cheap. And given you spend the whole day out, uh, it, it would be a perfect option. Just know that they are very, very bare. So don't expect you know, anything uh, um, fantastic. 
maybe Airbnb is a good idea. So to rent a private home, uh, I've never used it in Greece, so I wouldn't know what the quality of the Airbnb lodgings are in Greece, but I'm sure there are many to choose from. Gretchen, is an Acrapo, no, sorry, Ashley, if I were going to bring something back from Greece for my family or my house, what do you suggest uh, besides olive oil? <laughs> yeah, I would say, beside olive oil, I would suggest oregano. Oregano is dried, so it doesn't suffer for, from traveling, and it will be the best oregano of your life, especially if you do homemade pizza at home or homemade pasta with tomato sauce, you sprinkle it with that, and it's a, a totally different dish. As for a souvenir, an object, there is a typical object that you will see everywhere in Greece, in every souvenir shop, but not just souvenir shops, and it's made out of glass, of blue, light blue and white glass, and it is an eye. It's, of course, it's the symbol for an eye. It's not a, a realistic eye. Um, <clears throat> The eye is something that you find both in Greece and Turkey, and for them, it's a, it's a it's a it's a luck charm. It's something that brings luck because the eye keeps bad luck away. So it comes from a superstition, but it's stuck, and so now they sell these glass eyes everywhere. It's a tiny little nice object. They make uh, uh, fridge magnets out of them, or you have them on the string of a necklace. Uh, you all sorts. You can hang them on the wall. All sorts of of shapes. Uh, is an Acropolis a natural structure or is it human made? Thank you. This was fantastic. Thank, thanks, Gretchen. So, Acropolis uh, is two Greek words put together. Polis, uh, as in politics, uh, it means a city. So, polis is a city. Acro means uh, on top of, high. So, it was the highest part of the city. Um, so, yes, it's a place uh, that is naturally high, but that then gets built by human beings. So it has both aspects to it. How difficult is it to see the Pompeii of the Aegean on Santorini? Not difficult at all. Absolutely. Uh, they have a horrible website uh, that lacks uh, organization, in my opinion. But if you do look online, you will find opening times, the prices, uh, uh, the days when they're closed. Uh, and you can visit both uh, this actual site so you go through the streets of the ancient city and the archaeological museum because, for instance, the drawings on the walls that I showed you, they have been detached. The, the wall, the plaster has been detached and placed in cases uh, in the archaeological museum of Santorini so that they are sheltered. But you can visit both and it's absolutely doable um, very easily. James, is there a preponderance of immigrant issues in the islands? We went on island hop Lemos, uh, Simi, etc., to roads before Syria imploded. Husband is concerned about danger with refugee camps. Um, yes, oh, complicated to answer in just a few words. Yes, there is a crisis. And yes, Greece is the door to Europe when coming from the Middle East countries, either Middle Eastern countries uh, and Syria in this instance. Uh, so there are some islands, especially the ones uh, as Ikaria. Ikaria not actually, but the others around Ikaria, the bigger ones uh, like Lesbos and Samos, uh, which are closest to, to the border with Turkey, to the, to the um, coastline of Turkey, which are the first place where these refugees arrive when they are escaped escaping from their uh, war-ridden countries. As to the danger, I wouldn't say there's a danger. Refugee camps are controlled places, so it, it, it's not a far west uh, type of cowboys and Indians place. But they will provoke suffering in you. It is, uh, uh, it is heartbreaking to see these places and the conditions that these people are living in. Um, and uh, uh, so, yes, these islands, they struggle. There is another atmosphere than a, an island that hasn't been touched. So keep this in mind. It, it, it is, you know, a reality check. And it's an interesting contemporary history fact that we, that happens throughout our times that we are living. So I think it is important to not just turn the other way and not look, but keep it in mind if you want a carefree holiday. That's not what to go for, in my opinion. Graciela, what is the best way to travel from one city to another? Good point. Uh, it depends on the distance that you need to cover. So for instance, if you're going from Athens to Santorini, you want to get on a flight for sure. But if you're going from uh, uh, 
the shore close to Delphi to Kefalonia or uh, Zakynthos, then you take a ferry. Greece is full of ferry lines, of course, so they connect uh, the mainland with all the islands. So there is always a ferry available, especially if from a bigger island like Santorini, you want to access the smaller ones close to it, you will have ferry lines that connect them. Eve, once you get to the Santorini, is it accessible for a person traveling on your own or do you have to go with a group? You can totally do it on your own. I love to travel on my own. You just need to organize it a little bit ahead so you know, you know what to expect and maybe you have uh, booked at least your first night or two so you know where to crash at night when you arrive upon arrival, but it's totally doable on your own, absolutely. Miriam, I have unfortunately heard that there are issues of racism in Greece, some spurred by immigration. What is the diversity like there? Hmm. Again, you make a good point, Miriam. Yes, there are issues, uh, not just in Greece, actually. We are having a wave uh, of uh, these types of feelings all across Europe. I'm Italian, I live in Italy, and we are seeing this in Italy too, a rise of racism and uh, extreme uh, uh, right-wing uh, thinking. Definitely, it was uh, sparked by the immigration crisis. Uh, these people need uh, to be helped, but their resources are limited and it's difficult, you know, to balance it out uh, with what it's uh, best for your nation and your people. Um, but also probably the economical crisis that started in 2008 that hit us very hard, especially the southernmost countries in Europe. So Spain, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and Greece uh, um, has, uh, you know, kindled the fears of the people and brought them to extreme uh, behaviors and ideas. That's, again, it's a very superficial analysis and it, it's just from me. Is it safe to drive, <laughs> Graciela? Uh, you, you make a good point. Yes, it's safe to drive. I drove, but then I was scared. I was scared and I did it. I didn't die. But yes, uh, it is a bit of a 1940s uh, scenery when you get on the roads in Greece, uh, at least until recently. Maybe now it's a bit better. But it's not dangerous. You just need to be a bit careful. Eve, again, what island should you avoid to avoid partying college kids? Mykonos in the summer. Mykonos, it's um, close to, uh, it's in the Aegean Sea. Uh, don't go there in the summer. If you want to visit Mykonos, which is a beautiful island with beautiful landscape, you go in the uh, fall or in the early spring. Otherwise, it's full of uh, parties, parties all night long on all the beaches, so you can't get away. Do enough people in Greece uh, speak English that an English speaker can navigate the island successfully? Hmm. It depends. In Athens, probably yes. Um, on the islands, uh, it depends. Uh, mm, lots of Greeks uh, don't speak uh, English. Lots do, of course, but lots don't. So I wouldn't say there's a majority who does or who doesn't. But you will get along with them fine. They are lovely people, the Greeks. Uh, they are very welcoming, very hospitable, and they do want to help you and make your stay enjoyable. They are very proud of their country and of the fact that people want to visit it. So even if you have communication problems with the language, they will try to understand what you're saying and they will try to be understood by you if they're trying to help you. Gail, what is the area of Greece north and northwest like? We never hear about that part of Greece. Any tourism there? You're right, Gail. Uh, the, uh, the city of Thessaloniki is the main city in that area. Uh, I agree that we don't hear about it uh, uh, often enough and we don't visit it often enough. So Thessalonica is the region. Absolutely visit it. Um, the coast is similar to the south. It has a lot of inland parts, so you can also visit uh, if you want to hike. There's beautiful hikes. And Thessaloniki is a fantastic seaside city with a port. So as all harbor cities, uh, the people are you know, used to foreigners coming and going throughout their history. So they're very open, very welcome, very, uh, very graceful. James, uh, well, was there, was there excising of Ottomans when in 1820s Ottoman rule was overturned. I, I'm not understanding what you wrote. Um, if they killed the Ottomans when the, the uh, regime fell, no. When the regime fell, 
uh, Greece just passed to Turkey. I mean, the Ottoman Empire became Turkey and they were already Turks. Uh, so what was theirs became Turk and Turk and, and that's it. So uh, the independence came later on, but hmm, this is a big controversy between the Greeks and the Turkish. They both kind of hate each other to this day. So I don't want to lean for one side or the other, but I would say the Greeks suffered more being the subjects, you know, they suffered more than the Turks in that uh, occasion. Is Buzuki music all over Greece or is it uh, from a particular island? Uh, Brandy, I'm guessing it's from a particular island because I've never heard of it. So, but again, it's just a guess, sorry. Linda, is there a better place for folk dancing? I love the Greek dancing. Well, if you can get invited to a, a Greek wedding, then uh, you would see a lot of Greek dancing. Otherwise, there are some places uh, that also serve dinner or drinks at least. They are called tabernas or tavernas, tavern. And these, uh, if you can find uh, some that are not super touristic, uh, and the way of finding these places, guys, is just to walk. Walk out of the city center into the side streets. Uh, uh, walk, you know, get out of the main thoroughfares that all tourists uh, uh, stop onto to have their dinner, their pita or whatever, and just explore unknown areas. In a city as Athens, you will never really get lost. You will always either find a subway stop or someone to ask to for directions. And nowadays with Google Maps, uh, it's impossible to get lost anywhere on earth. So explore. Th that's how you find uh, the less touristic and most uh, out um, off the beaten path uh, places. And the Greek dancing might be there. And have they recovered from the financial problems of re recent years? Uh, partly, yes, they're still working on it. It's a long way to go. Mary, uh, how many days would you plan to visit all of the places you discussed? All of the places. So we had Athens, uh, Delphi, uh, Kefalonia, Zakynthos, Santorini, Ikaria. Six places spread all throughout Greece at least two weeks to, you know, have a good trip. Would Crete be a good place for retirement? Can you access most of Europe and Greece from Crete? Thank you, Elise. Um, I've never thought of it. I think yes. It depends on what you want for your retirement. Crete uh, has a couple of especially one big town where the airport is, where one of the airports is. The other is a little smaller town, but it has another airport. So two airports that could connect you with the rest of the world, even though they are small ones. So most flights go through Athens before leaving for other countries. I, I would say yes, I would live in Crete, my retirement, absolutely. Margarita, would you like to tell us about a cooking school or two? I love to learn about the food in this way. Thank you. Absolutely. Let's do it this way. I will write it down for Mara, send it to Mara. And uh, maybe when she sends out the links that I was mentioning before, she can also include uh, the suggestions for cooking classes so that you can see it written down. Barbara. Was it the slaves that built the Parthenon and where did they get the marble from? So the quarries are not too far from uh, the Acropolis, even though thinking back uh, four centuries before Christ with no technology, you know, to cut in the quarry the blocks of stone and then bring them all the way to Athens and then up the Acropolis, it must have been really a feat. Um, well, the slaves, yes and no. There were workers, stonemasons that weren't slaves, and some, yes, so both. Laura, do they speak English in Ia, and which hotels do you recommend? Um, yes, they speak English in Ia. You know, in these very, very famous touristic islands, such as Santorini, they are very much used to tourists. So these are the places uh, that are most likely, where you are most likely to find uh, people who speak English. As for the hotels, uh, off the top of my head, I don't really have a name or two. But again, if anything comes to mind, I will write it to Mara to pass it along, okay? And Mary again, what is the best way to get to from Athens to Meteora? Driving driving. It's really not too far away. And uh, on your way, you get to see the Corinth Canal from the highway. So it's a beautiful view. It's a very scenic uh, drive. So driving, definitely. All I think right. I, well, I look at the chat, Mara. I don't know if there are other questions. 
I, I managed to answer all of the chat questions. So I think we are good and we've come to an end, even though, you know, I always say that all good things must come to an end and this tour is no different than anything else. But I truly appreciate everybody who stayed on. We had a lot of people stay on for the entire thing. I, I can't thank you enough, Elena, and I can't wait to see you again um, in, in real life as opposed to on a virtual tour. But thank you everybody for joining us. I'm gonna sign off and Elena, you can give your thanks as well and we'll end this tour. Thank you for your constant growing participation in these events. Mara and I, we have a lot of fun. I hope I'm talking for you too, Mara. We have a lot of fun. You are. Together, so it's an honor. Thank you so much. All right. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye.